Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Ash, and uh, today is this. <laughs> so as a... Oh, do I have this unmuted? Yes, I do. Oh, wow, that's really loud. My apologies. I'm gonna sync back a little bit with the microphone. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, the, as a kind of like a milestone thing with, uh, with my patron, um, I promised that I was going to read both Dragon Age Asunder and Dragon Age Masked Empire. Today is going to be Dragon Age Masked Empire. And because Cole was just released and all of that, I think next week, either next week or uh, earlier time, I'll do Asunder and then we'll get to see Cole and all of his action. Well, sort of. I guess you'll listen to it. Anywho. <laughs> yeah, so how this is going to work is I'm going to read one chapter every week or more depending on how long it takes uh, I haven't read this in a while uh, since it came out so I'm just kind of like I, I bet you I'm going to totally mess up on the French words and um, the French words and the French words and anything that is French and also uh, my poor attempts at Frenchness uh, with the accents <laughs> so anyway thank you guys for coming appreciate it and uh oh by the way this is the book um whoops sorry this book is by Patrick Week so if you want to pick up your own copy I s highly suggest it so you can then read it on your own or if you want you can uh follow next time whenever I do the stream so mm. oh one more thing uh so only a couple of days left until I give away this shirt well not this shirt I have two more this is the Dragon Age shirt that we got at uh, E3, and uh, I don't know if I can do this or not, but it has like a huge Inquisition logo on the back. So all you have to do is say, who is your Inquisitor? Describe him or her to me, and use the hashtag D-A-I-G-W on Twitter, and it gets you in. And it's international, so feel free to enter. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, mm, I'm just drinking something I pulled from the Twitch offices, so, I mean, it's strawberry kiwi, or water with strawberry kiwi, but you don't want to know that, you want to read, uh, or listen to Masked Empire, so, I think I already went through all the disclaimers, I already apologize for all the, uh, different things I'm totally gonna mess up as far as the, uh, the accents and all that jazz, so, yeah. All right, so I'll start. So this is Dragon Age, The Masked Empire by Patrick Weeks. Chapter one. Empress Selene strode into the University of Orlais' great Chantry courtyard, surrounded by her entourage of servants and guards and flanked by Sir Michael, her champion. The entire faculty had been assembled to greet her and the professors bowed at her approach. In the wan morning light, the marble walls glistened, glittered <laughs> like fresh fallen snow. The stone tiles of the courtyard had been set with a mosaic of Andraste, proud and defiant in her mother-of-pearl armor with carnelian flames behind her. Selene noted with approval that the mosaic had been restored since her last visit, where she had seen that time, and careless boots had knocked some of the stones loose. The mosaic of Andraste stared with lapis lazuli eyes at the chantry that gave the courtyard its name. It was the tallest building in the university, displaying its dominance with a pair of shining bronze domes that the university students jokingly called the bosom of Andraste. Not that the university chancellor had mentioned that to Celine, of course. Over the great bronze doors, over a mural of Andraste and her disciples, a phrase from the Chant of Light had been set into the stone in gold. A learned child is a blessing upon his parents and unto the Maker. The University of Chancellor and his professor stood with heads bowed beneath the phrase as Celine and her entourage made their way across the mosaic of Andraste. Your Imperial Majesty, Chancellor Henry Morak said, and at a gesture from Celine, he and the other professors rose from their bows. We are honored by your visit. 
In such troubled times, Morak, I find myself taking comfort in the knowledge and wisdom you and your university provide the future of Olay. Celine smiled and gestured to her attendants. And two of them produce a jumble of intricately wrought silverite that, with a few twists and turns, could ingeniously be shaped into a small but surprisingly comfortable bench. Sir Michael stepped aside, his eyes taking in the walkways and windows set into the marble walls, alert for any threat to the Empress, but always projecting the air of confidence Selene required in those who served her personally. Morak started. He had clearly expected to invite her into his office to discuss the reason for Selene's visit in his place of authority, and perhaps show off a new manuscript some promising student had uncovered. Beneath the comparatively simple mask he wore at a younger son of the Morak family, his lips pursed in confusion and concern as he took a moment to reposition his approach to the conversation for an outdoor setting. Selene was quietly pleased to have him off balance so early. The Empress wore a creamy satin gown trimmed with ropey strands of pearls and woven with intricate patterns of gold set with amethyst to mark the colors of the Valmont family. Her position as Empress dictated that this was the lightest and most comfortable gown she could wear in public, except when she went riding, but it nevertheless weighed enough to crush her back and waist by the end of the day. She settled onto the small silverite bench, careful, as always, that no sign of relief or discomfort betrayed her. She was aided in hiding her expression by the half mask that all Orlesians, Orlesian nobles wore in public. It was inlaid with moonstone, and lines of gold suggested cheekbones and a nose. Tiny purple sapphires ringed her eyes, and dyed peacock feathers swept back from her head to ring her with a crown of gold and violet. The sapphires and feathers could be replaced with other colors to match a particular gown or present a special occasion. Below the mask, the Empress's face was powdered white and her lips were lined with deep red. If your Imperial Majesty wishes, Chancellor Morak began, Professor Ducey would be pleased to give a reading from his dissertation on the inferiority of Canari society. It is a bold attempt to expand on brother upon Brother Genitivi's earlier writings, and if I recall correctly, you found his earlier work quite promising. If you're... That indeed sounds lovely, Celine said, and waited until Morak had half-turned to one of the professors on his right before adding. But, I find discussion of the great horned rulers of Parvolin somewhat stock on a day already beset by the promises of winter's chill. As he jerked back to attention, she added, Perhaps one of your professors could entertain us with a study of mathematics. I have, in my own simple way, been struggling with Varanian's theorem, and I would be quite grateful if one of your learned scholars could explain the process by which it is proven. For a moment, the great courtyard was silent, but a few, for a few birds which, fed by the students or grandkids keepers, had elected not to fly south for the winter. Chancellor Morak swallowed. Even as a younger son, he, could, he should have had composure. Selene wondered idly whether his open expression had led his family to banish him from the dangers of the imperial court to the scholarly life, or if he had forgotten his courtly training since coming to the university. In either case, it spoke ill of him. Your radiance, he, fi he said finally. You think too little of your own scholarly pursuits. Varanian's theorem is exceedingly complex. I confess, in my own mathematical studies, the waves of my intellect have broken upon its rocky shores with little result. However, if you seek a mathematical demonstration, I have devised a treatise upon a specific ratio found in nature so often that it must reflect the maker's own hand. I would be honored to- T. Selene asked, and gestured to one of her attendants, 
who produced an elegant silver pot inscribed with runes that kept the water within hot, but no need for a fire. Another servant drew forth cups and saucers of uneven porcelain so fine that the morning sun shone through them. Surely one of the other professors has mastered Vranian's theorem. The University of Orlais can hardly be the most learned institution in Thetis, if we cannot understand the work of a simple Tevinter scholar. Chancellor Morak looked affronted at that. Perhaps the man had not totally lost his noble pride at all. I assure you, your radiance, the University of Orlais is unparalleled in the pursuit of knowledge and culture, and due in no small part to the fact that Tevinter scholars are but slaves to the majors who rule them, in granting us freedom from pressures religious or political. You have empowered us to further Olay's culture. Yes, Morak still remembered enough courtly training to throw the occasional barb. Celine was pleased to see that the conversation might be interesting after all. One of your students, then? When I was riding with Comtesse Helene last year, she told me that she was sponsoring a young man whose mathematical abilities were nothing short of prodigious. She took the teacup her servant offered and took a small sip. Now that I think about it. He was studying Varanian's theorem. And the discussion led me to peruse it myself. Lennon, I believe, was the young man's name. Ah, yes, said Morak, his gaze going flinty, as he saw where Selene was headed. I think I remember his application. And while, of course, our doors are open to anyone who, through noble blood or proper sponsorship, are able to ensure that they will continue our distinguished traditions. Tell me, Morak, Selene said, and paused to sip her tea. You study mathematics. Are you familiar with the number zero? It was excellent tea, a Ravani blend of cinnamon, ginger, and cloves, sweetened with honey just as Selene liked. Yes, your radiance, Morak said after a moment of silence, when it became clear that the question was not rhetorical. He took the teacup Selene's servant offered him with scarcely concealed irritation. Excellent. That is the number of students at your university who do not come from noble blood. I confess to some disappointment in the matter, Chancelier Morak, as I hope to see some improvement since our last talk. Your radiance. Drink your tea, Morak. I have not asked you to let peasants scurry through your holes. I have asked you to come to admit commoners who obtain sponsorship from a noble who recognize them, in them, some intelligence that transcends blood and offers a chance for Olay to become greater through their studies. Morak's knuckles were white on the saucer he held. The young man you spoke of, your imperial majesty, was an elf. Celine turned to her champion, Sir Michael de Chavin who was regal in silverite armor ena enameled with the imperial coat of arms. His own family's coat of arms was, in was inset, just above his heart, while his mask was a simpler reflection of Celine's own. Sir Michael, I believe the chevaliers are renowned for their keen eyes. Tell me, is there not an elf already present with us in the courtyard? <laughs> Sir Michael smiled slightly. In a matter of speaking, Majesty, he pointed at the chantry, specifically the mural up over the great bronze doors. If I am not mistaken, that mural is a faithful reproduction of Andraste and her disciples by the legendary Henry de Lides. At the time Henry created the original, the elves were still considered allies, as they had not yet attacked and betrayed or lay. Twenty years later, when Divine Renata called for an exiled march against the elves, she also ordered the destruction of all Chantry art that included elves. He smiled. But Henry Delides pleaded with, the, with such grace and passion that she relented and allowed this single piece to survive. 
provided that Henry chopped the ears of the now heretical disciple Chartan. Celine inclined her head gracefully. Ah, oh, yes. And it seems the university has copied the original piece quite faithfully. Can you point out Chartan, Morak? The ears have been altered, but the large eyes make it quite clear. Morak looked at the moral, then back at Celine. Of course, Your Radiance. Unlike the Chantry, the university prides itself on creating an accurate version of history. Vision of history. That is indeed the elf whom Andraste freed from servitude to the vile Tevinter Imperium. How strange that the university is so eager to fight against pressures religious, to limit its fields of studies, would in this matter be unwilling to bend even as far as divine Renata herself. It is a puzzle, Majesty, Sir Michael said and looked over at Chancelier Morak. The Chancelier took a long sip from the teacup, then set it back in its saucer, the porcelain clinking as his cup rattled. We would, of course, be honored to review Comtesse Helene's application again. Orlais honors your commitment to our culture and scholarship. Celine inclined her head and stood. One attendant took the small silverite bench and collapsed it behind her, and Celine handed her cup and saucer to another. Now, after this talk of matters religious, I believe I would like to spend a moment appreciating the lessons this chantry can teach. See that I am not disturbed, Chancellor Morak. Then she smiled and, as a peace offering, added, When I am done, I would indeed be interested in hearing more about this ratio you say shows the hand of the maker. The professors bowed and hurriedly stood aside as Celine approached the great bronze doors. Celine's own servants held back as well, save Sir Michael. You might have informed me of the tr of the turn you expected the conversation to take, Majesty, he murmured. The heresy of Chartan is not precisely common knowledge. Celine smiled without looking his way. I had faith in you, my champion. Shall I accompany you inside? I believe I will be safe enough in the bosom of Andraste, Celine said as Sir Michael pulled the door open. Michael looked inside, taking in the room and assessing any potential dangers, then turned to her and nodded and she walked in alone. The air was cool inside, though without the chill of the autumn wind, it was more comfortable than it had been outside. The stained glass windows cast beams of crimson light across the wooden benches, whose oiled scent filled the chantry. At the end of the hall, the eternal flame burned brightly in a great golden brazier, the only other light beyond the windows. The chantry was empty save for a red-haired woman in a lay sister's robes, who rose to her feet as Celine came forward. Your Imperial Majesty, she murmured, bowing deeply. Sparring with Chancellor Morak over the elves had been a gentle prelude to the real test of the morning. Celine gestured for the woman before her to rise. I am glad the Divine was willing to meet. The red-haired woman smiled. She was unmasked, as those who served the Chantry most often were. And while she spoke with a native Orlesian accent, her features were Ferelden. The masks were part of the game, the ruthless and endless contest by which dynasties were founded and lost in Orlais. And the Chantry's insistence that the, their people go unmasked was meant to suggest that they were beyond politics. It was a suggestion that few in Orlesian nobility took seriously. The matter at hand is, as your messenger said, quite serious, and the divine would like to see it resolved. I am her voice in this regard. You may call me Nightingale. Beneath her mask, 
Celine raised an eyebrow. The Empress of Orlais was rarely asked to address someone by a pseudonym. Still, Justinia would only have sent someone she truly trusted. Without ceremony, Celine sat down on one of the benches, her creamy satin gown bunching awkwardly in amethyst, jangling against the wood. You are familiar, Nightingale. With the tension between the Templars and the mages? When Nightingale hesitated, Celine waved for the other woman to sit as well. Of course, your radiance. Nightingale sat, moving with a casual grace and coming to rest with her simple robes unwrinkled and unbunched. The subtle series of movements was the mark of a trained bard, and Celine filed the observation. Wait for use as needed. The Templars have become even more restless since what happened in Kirkwall, Celine said, staring at the brilliant red light of the stained glass depiction of Andraste on the pyre. Years of training let her see the woman beside her clearly at the edge of her vision, as have the mages for that matter. What does Dorothea intend to do? She had used D Divine Justinia's given name deliberately, and saw from the corner of her eye as Nightingale reacted. The woman's eyes narrowed a tiny fraction, while her posture remained unchanged. Anger, then, but no insulted propriety. Nightingale might call the divine by her given name, might well have known her before she rose to the position. All this passed in a heartbeat, as Nightingale said. The divine does not wish to assume that what transpired in Kirkwall was nothing more than the actions of a single mad mage driven to tragic action by overzealous Templars. You know that in some major city states, mages face more restrictions than they do in Orlais. I do, Celine said, and also I know that you have not answered my question. If Dorothea proposes to do nothing to unite the Templars and the mages, she is following in the footsteps of Grand Cleric Athena, who waited and prayed while Kirkwall tore itself apart. She turned and faced Nightingale directly. The other woman had reacted again at the use of Divine's given name. Justinia wishes to see this world made better. Your radiance. We gain nothing by acting capriciously. Sometimes events do not allow us the time we wish, especially when magic is at play. Celine looked at Nightingale, who sat as a proper lady, relaxed and poised in her simple robes, and made a guess. I understand that, during the last blight, the Circle Tower in Ferelden was nearly lost when one of the senior mages became an abomination. After killing the creatures, the hero Ferelden was forced to decide on the spot whether to kill every remaining mage in the tower. Her barb struck home. As Nightingale blinked, then said with heat, We are hardly in the thick of battle, your radiance. We are always in battle, Celine said. It is only that some of us do not always realize it. A bard named Marjolaine told me, once told me that. I heard she met an unfortunate end in Ferelden. She sighed. Isn't that sad, Nightingale? Nightingale paused for a moment, looking at Celine with cautious respect. I suppose, she finally said, it is a matter of perspective. And perhaps, you may call me Liliana. Perhaps I might. Celine said and smiled before lowering her voice and continuing. Divine Justinia must know this. I have nobles begging in private salon salons for the throne to take the red action in this matter. At Liliana's shocked look, she nodded. There are men of Orlais who would sooner see us march upon our own people in the name of safety. I would despise that. Dorothea knows that I would, but I must offer them some alternative. Liliana stood, frowning in thought. You wish the Divine to make some overt show of ameliorating the situation. 
Celine let out a breath. In truth, any overt show will bring complaints that I have allowed the Chantry free reign to rule this empire for me, she said, and Liliana nodded wordlessly. But if Justinia can calm tempers before I am forced to turn the blade of the empire upon itself, then I will pay such a price willingly. Liliana smiled. You think less for yourself and more for Olay than I had expected. Your radiance. It is a fortunate quality in a reader. In a ruler, and one I have not seen enough. Celine stood as well, and for a moment her gown was bathed in the crimson light of the stained glass. Tell me something. How large was the archdemon? Liliana laughed the delicate, cultured laugh of a noble woman or train bard. The effect made her sister's robes look like a poor disguise. <laughs> Large enough, your radiance, that after had seeing it, most problems seemed small by comparison. Her face turned serious, and she added, I will ask Justinia to consider acting directly. She will want your support to head off accusations that she might be attempting to steal power for herself. Of course. Perhaps if she made a statement at a ball thrown in her honor? Liliana considered it. It is not the place where one would expect to make such a pronouncement. Which is why you like the idea, Celine said, smiling. It will also ensure that many of the nobles petitioning me for action will have little choice but to hear her words and know that the matter is being attended to. Liliana grinned. You were trained as a bard as well, your radiance. It is easy to forget. I shall take the proposal to the divine. Three weeks, Celine said, or at most, a month. Any longer and I will have no choice but to act. The nobles will want some sign of resolution before they retire to the winter homes. Liliana bowed. Your Imperial Majesty. The divine spy left through a hidden side door, and Celine sat back down on the bench. This time, mindful of her training, she sat without making a sound or wrinkling her gown in the slightest. Three more weeks of gritting her teeth and dealing with Grand Duke Espard, who agitated the other nobles in an attempt to start a war. Three weeks of trying to ignore the idiotic arguments started by thuggish Templars and mages who refused to see the way of the world. And her reward for perseverance would be Gaspard bellowing that he, she had let the Chantry have more power, as though power was a sword only one person could hold at a time. It was not. Power was a dance. To be navigated with partners, knowing when to lead, when to follow, and when simply stepping on the hem of a rival's gown could send her into the ground in shame. In careless hands, such power could bring down the greatest empire in Thetis. The culture and history of all of Orlais was Selene's to protect. It was at times like these that she enjoyed the simple pleasure of bending a recalcitrant professor at her will. Three weeks, Celine said, and allowed herself a moment to watch the fiery light play through the stained glass. The half-masks that the nobility wore in public were always mirrored by the masks of their servants, albeit less extravagantly, and with less variation than the nobles, who could often afford different masks as the needs of fashion dictated. If a lord's house mask was a lion carved from ivory and inlaid with onyx and gold, his servant's mask would be lions as well, painted black and lined with brass. The mask protected the servants when they were about, warning tradesmen and merchants that any offense given to the servant was potentially an offense to the servant's master. To servants of other houses, the masks were a way to instantly recognize a 
a potential ally, or a potential enemy. The mask worn in the royal palace was Val Royo, at Val Royo, by servants who were to be seen in public, mirrored the one worn by Empress Selene. Where hers was inlaid with moonstone, theirs were simply enameled, or inlaid with ivory for the highest ranking servants, and the gold and violet were simply painted on. Below the half mass, the servants of Val Royo painted their faces white, a mark of additional status. To a visitor, looking at a sea of pale faces trimmed with the gold and violet, the servants were almost identical. The women wore serving dresses, the men tight breeches, both cut in the latest fashion and dyed in their royal colors. Only the guards and the servants who were never meant to be seen, the cook and the, her assistants, for example, or the laborers who cleaned the privy, had their faces visible. But the goal for the half mass that every servant wore was pageantry, not anonymity. Otherwise, the mask would have covered Briala's elven ears. You there, rabbit, called the Chatelain as Briala passed the great hall. Briala turned. Mistress? Turn you out, did they? The Chatelain looked back to the great hall where servants on ladders were adjusting a great purple banner so that the golden lion of Empress Celine's house, Valmont, would hang at the proper height. It may be acceptable to have her... You dress her ma imperial majesty on a normal day, but for a ball, they'll want everything proper. She squinted. Higher on the left! Brielle had seen the Chatelain prepare for countless balls before. The woman was always angry and snappish at the time, taking out her anxiety on anyone she could. Today felt different, however. Her barb had little heat behind it, and all the servants knew that Brielle got on well with the girls who dressed Celine for the most formal occasions. She had to, lest they become rivals. What was more, a few stray locks of the Chatelaine's hair had been caught under her mask, a faux pas that was completely unacceptable for any servant in the Imperial Palace. The Chatelaine could not have failed to notice it unless she removed her mask and then put it on quickly. Yes, mistress, Briella said. She had been Celine's handmaid since childhood, when the Empress had just been one girl among countless rivals for the throne. Now in Val Royo, Brielle was one of the few elves who had been granted the mask of public service. Well, you can make yourself useful then. Run to the kitchen and speak with the cook and her girls. The weather had been dry. And I won't have the meat go dry along with it. She turned back to Briella. Last autumn, Lady Montsimard said that the circle of magi served better duck than we did. She glared, the narrowing of her eyes visible through the slits in her mask. Tell the girls that if this happens this year, I'll have them wit. Yes, mistress, Briella said again, ducking her head to make her respect clear. The hierarchy among the palace servants was strict and clear, and while Brianna's status as Celine's personal handmaid set her off to one side of the chain of command, she was by no means free of it completely. Oh, no need to worry, rabbit, the Chatelain patted Brianna familiarly on the shoulder, as she did. Brianna saw that the clasp on the other woman's cuff was unfastened. Another mistake that the servants who dressed the Chatelain would never have made. It's just to put the fear of the maker in the lazy things. We never whip you. Off you go now. Yes, mistress. Brielle said for a third time, and left as the Chatelain began yelling at the servants to lower the left side of the banner. As she strode down the great hallway, the floors covered with fine Navarra carpet, and the walls lined with classical paintings and curls of swirling stucco, Briella thought. The Chatelain had served Celine faithfully for more than a decade. 
She cared deeply about the job and would never allow herself to be distracted on the day of the ball unless if she were somehow compromised. The clasp and the stray hair suggested a new lover who had pressed his or her suit and taken a few moments of the Chatelain's time. It could have been nothing more than that, of course, but in Valerio, everything was part of the game, even the clandestine affairs of the more important servants. Brielle had grown up watching the game, and as one of Celine's pieces, she was determined to win. If Brielle assumed the worst, the Chatelain would not knowingly be involved in the matter, and embarrassment to Celine would bring embarrassment to the Chatelain as well. And if, make her forbid, Celine died or lost power, the Chatelain would be would doubtless be replaced. If this was something more than an over-eager new lover, the Chatelain was a tool, not an active member of whatever plot was unfolding. The question was, whose tool? The heat in the kitchens was stifling, as dishes from all across the known world were prepared. The cook, Rylene, was a heavy, ruddy-faced woman, whose thick forearms were burn-scarred from an accident in her youth. If the result of the former Chatelain's thinking that Rylene was becoming presumptuous could be called an accident. Brielle liked her, and she did what she could to protect the woman, who was better at making pastries than she was at the intricacies of the game. Miss Bria, Rylene called out, beaming, as Brielle came in. Does her radiance need something to last her until the evening banquet? We've, <laughs> we've some lovely pastries from Lides. Thank you, Rylene, but no. She looked at Rylene's girls. Some human, but many of them elven, and none of them masked. They were not to be seen by nobles. The Chateaulians had concerns about the duck. She was very empathetic. Emphatic. Rylene gave her a graceful nod. I will see to it personally. She dusted flour over her scarred hands and moved over a pot, where a roasted dish was simmering in the sauce. And if you could send one of the girls to find out any last-minute changes the Chatelain had made, Brielle asked. Of course, Miss Briar. Rylene smiled. I'll have her find you. Thank you. Brielle left the kitchens and made her way around the palace. In the great hall, the Chatelain had finished with the banners and was now yelling her way through the organizations of the tables. The elaborate card rooms bordering the hall had been, had each been decorated in the style of a different country, from the great bearskin rugs and golden Mabari statuettes of Ferelden to the decadent silks and magical lamps of Deventer. The balconies offered a view of the great hall, as well as an escape to fresh air outside, where verandas overlooked a hedge maze, dotted with sparkling marble fountains. You there! Knife here! Unlike rabbit, which is usually spoken in a friendly conversation, that only made Rial grit her teeth a little, knife here could never be mistaken for anything but an insult. It was what a human might use to address gutter trash that was too lazy to work and too stupid to steal. The captain of the palace guard did not wear a mask. None of the palace guards did. It would be too easy for an assassin to blend in and get close to the empress, while armed and armored. His face displayed the long angles that spoke of noble blood, and beneath his surcoat, emblazoned with the golden line of House Falmont, his ceremonial breastplate gleam. More importantly to Briala, one of the buckles on his breastplate was askew, and he had the welt from a love bite just below one ear. Trying to sneak around and dodge your duties, knife ear, he said with a sneer. The Empress bade me examine the preparations for tonight's banquet. Briala did not bow. As a captain of the guard, he was important enough that she should, but Briella had enough power to skirt the rules when she truly wanted to. And at the moment, she truly did. A pretty story, he sniffed. 
and then examine with a new interest. Though if you're keen to find some distraction, you have a fair enough form that I might ignore these flaps of filth gutting from your head. He stepped closer, blocking her view of the garden. Perhaps I might even hold them like reins. He smelled of sweat as well as lavender, the Chateaulian's favorite scent. She stepped back inside. I doubt the Empress would approve. She turned and left without a backwards look, still thinking. The captain of the guard was carrying on with the Chateaulian, and his intentions had clearly been meant to harass her until she left, to distract her from looking down at the hedge maids below, which is why he had to move to block her from view. From what Riala remembered, the captain had been brought in recently, after his predecessor had died. Before that, the man had served in the military. Briala didn't know where, but given Grand Duke Espad's popularity with the soldiers, she knew who and where. All that was left was to find out what. She hurried down a curving staircase whose marble steps were carpeted with red velvet, but a call from behind stopped her before she reached the doorway leading out to the hedge mage. Miss Bria! Briala turned to see one of the elves who worked in the kitchen hurrying her way. I was told to find you. Thank you, Disrael. Briella smiled at the young woman. What have you found? Disrael lowered her voice and tugged at her sleeve nervously with thin fingers. The Chatelier added a bod, Melkanda, to tonight's guest list. Briella nodded. Nodded. Thank you. Now, if Rylene can spare you for another moment, may I ask you to find out what the captain of the guard has been doing today? Of course, Miss Bria. Rylene said that I was at your disposal. Good. Briella turned to the hedge mage. Maze. I will be in there. Hunting. Selene had seen the Orlesian Chevalier's terrain. One of their most famous tests, at least among those tests they showed in public, was a series of blades mounted on posts in a great wooden scaffolding. When servants worked at a massive hidden wheel, the blades would spin and, spl and slash, attacking anyone who passed with dizzying speed. Brave youths at the summer festivals would try to rush through in heavy padded tunics. The blades blunted so that most contestants broke no more than their pride. In real tests, it was said, the blades were sharpened, and the soldier ran the gauntlet unarmored. That gauntlet was always how Selene imagined the formal banquets. Fortunately, she did not run this gauntlet alone. Her champion, Sir Michael, was a pace behind her, as always, unarmored so as not to cause a disturbance as Selene navigated the crowd, but carrying his blade, nevertheless. His hose wore rich golden silk, and his doublet was violet suede, made from beasts the dwarves raised like cattle. His scabbard was ornamented with an inlaid lion of gold, with purple sapphires for the eyes and mane, and while his hands were bare of the rings and bracelets other nobles favored, he would allow nothing to impede his ability to handle a blade. He wore atop his mask a tall yellow feather of the chevaliers. Orders, Majesty. He asked, in a voice low enough to carry only to her. Michael usually spoke little at these events, which Selene appreciated. As her champion, he was an extension of her public presence, drawing attention not to himself, but to her. He cared little for the game, but he had good eyes and followed orders. He had been with her for almost ten years since her last champion had died stopping an assassin. Briala passed along what she found? The sword in the bushes? Yes, Majesty. He kept his voice low and calm, and by his body language, they might have been discussing the lovely wyvern ice sculptures at the refreshment table. Watch the bard, Melkinda. It will begin with her. 
Hopefully I will not be expected to pass any tests of religious iconography this evening. Celine checked a smile. I will attempt to warn you this time should the need arise. As Gaspard's bard, Melkinder, sang in a lovely voice about the end of summer and lost loves, Celine moved through a field of allies and enemies, well-wishers and would-be rivals. Your radiance, Comte Chantral of Velen bowed at her eye contact, the motion making a string of black pearls attached to his neck. Mask rattled. Your light will keep the birds from departing this autumn, for they will think the summer lingers. Chantral had been pressing for her hand in marriage for some time now. Given his apparent loyalty and clumsiness in the game, Celine kept him at a comfortable and friendly distance without ever completely dashing his hopes. Celine's ivory gown was cut low, and against her pale skin, a yellow diamond glittered in a rich golden setting. The gown complemented the great jewel, as teardrops of amber flowed from her bosom in ye ribbons of yellow that darkened gold at the hem and wrists. Her mask was identical to the one she'd wore that morning, save for the feathers that had been switched to gold filigree. Your kindness is as soothing as the warm waters of Lake Celestine, she said, and though I fear the birds must depart or die in the winter chill, I know they will grace the skies of Valoon come springtime. She moved on and caught the eye of Lady Montsimoj, whose mask was set with glowing lyrium crystals on each cheek, a gift from the first enchanter in the Orlesian circle. Cousin, she said with friendly familiarity, as the other woman gave a deep curtsy. It's been too long. Tell me, how did you enjoy the duck? The sauce was divine, your radiance. Lady Montsimod and her husband had entertained Grand Duke of Spa during the summer, and in the past had held out a family's proximity to, and control of, the circle as a bargaining chip. Celine found that the husband dangerous and the wife dull, and suspected that Lady Montsimod did not realize how precarious the situation with the mages had become. Her guess proved true, as Lady Montsimod added. Though in truth, when we visited the Circle of Magi, oh, I should have a care when dining with them. Celine cut in a light laugh. It seems that when they try to prepare a meal, everything around them ends up burned. She moved on as Lady Montsimod stammered out her farewell with a strained smile. Behind her, Celine knew without looking that Sir Michael had fixed Lady Montsimod with a disapproving stare, a wordless reminder that Celine could laugh and play the game, or if she chose, she could have Mo Lady Montsimod's head mounted on a pike. She made a note to speak to Madame de Fer, the mage of the imperial court, about Montsimod's familiarity with the mages. On and on she went through the crowd, trading greetings and kind words laced with poison. Chaudrelet pushed for more advantageous trading terms with Ferelden while the upstart kingdom was still recovering from the blight? What was to be done to ensure that nothing like Kirkwall would happen there? Was a university where noble sons came to study truly going to start admitting knife ears? Celine's jaw ached from smiling. It was the clearest expression visible below the half mask and under the layers of makeup that covered her face. Beneath the bladed words, Melkinder's beautiful voice continued. Then finally, the pageantry ended with the laughter of Grand Duke Espad. It was a deep, booming bellow that had echoed across battlefields. It silenced the timid and the servants like a death knell, and, pull and pulled the other lords and ladies into chuckles with its weight. The crowd before Celine parted, showing a clear path to the Grand Duke and the dark-haired haired bard before him. Melkinder was unmasked, though. She wore the heavy makeup commoners donned at noble gatherings, and she had turned away in embarrassment at whatever Gaspard said. Celine steeled herself without any outward change of expression. She had played the game for most of her life. No matter how prepared she was, no matter how much 
she had considered and planned and determined her strategy. There was always one moment of fear. Then the moment was over, and she was moving towards the bard who had been surreptitiously added to the guest list, at the command of a guard captain loyal to Gaspard. Sir Michael's steady footsteps moved in time with hers, the large man matching her pace perfectly. Melkandar was good, Selene noted, but not perfect. The makeup covered the fact that she could not affect the blush that would signal actual embarrassment, but she would have been smarter to add red makeup at the cheeks to give the assembled nobles the impression anyway. Seeing that little imperfection, not even a mistake as such, but a detail that Selene could have done better, somehow made everything seem easier. And with what wit has my cousin silenced so sweet a voice? Selene asked into the expectant silence. Melkinder paused, uncomfortable. But Gaspar dipped his head, a bow just barely sufficient to avoid undeniable insult. Your Imperial Majesty, he said, still chuckling. I was pointing out that the young lady's song had a melody similar to King Megrin Mabari. The assembled nobles tittered, scandalously amused. Selene kept her smile in place. It was a good first strike. The song had been popular and harmless decades ago, during the Orlesian occupation of Ferelden. It told the story of the unhappy Megrin, sent against his will to Ferelden by Emperor Florian. In the song, the hapless noble was comically frustrated at every turn by rough Ferelden culture, including a slobbering Mabari hound that ate his mask. Well, never forbidden. The song had lost its popularity after King Merrick of Ferelden killed Megrin. Since coming to power, Selene had done her best to strengthen the ties between the two countries, and the song mocking the crude Ferelden's and their uncultured customs had never come back into fashion. Until now, it seemed. I remember singing this with the men during marches, Gaspard said. It took us back to the days when Orlais stood poised to conquer the world. Poor Megrin, trapped far from the Maker's gaze, trying to make himself a home among the dog lords. He was a tall man, broad in shoulder, and his doublet and hose were cut, with hard lines and silver trim to give him the impression of armor. His mask was gold, set with emeralds to match his family's heraldry, and a tall yellow feather sprouted from the mask like Sir Michael. He was a member of the Chevaliers. He was also standing not ten paces from Van Tegen the Ferelden ambassador. The man's face, bare of makeup, clearly showed his anger hearing his people called dog lords. It was a sad time for all of us, Selene said, turning to the ambassador with a smile. And Orle is pleased to count Ferelden as a friend in these trying times. He again smiled greatly and bowed. Your Imperial Majesty, Ferelden hopes the same. Of course, Gaspard strode forward. What's past is past, eh, Tegan? And now we're just two old warriors. He clapped the Ferelden on the shoulder, and Ban Tegan stiffened at the familiarity. Did you bring your dog with you to Orlais, my lord? Melkinda added. The dark-haired bard, the very picture of innocence, even as the crowd chuckled. Tegan turned to her, fists clenched at his sides. Yes, though not to this ball. I doubt he'd appreciate the food. That got a laugh from the crowd. While not a master of the game, the Ferelden noble was smart enough to see when he was being set up and to try to get the crowd on his side. Someday I'll have your to see your dog, Tegan, Gaspard said, not to be distracted from his play. But tonight, in celebration of the friendship between our empire and y your, your, uh, kingdom, I brought something for you. He snapped his fingers, and a servant rushed up, carrying a long bundle wrapped in rich green velvet. 
Gaspard took the package and handed it to Tegan with a wide smile. Reluctantly, knowing he was stepping into a trap, but unable to find a way to avoid doing so, the ambassador unwrapped the package. Inside, as Briella had been informed Celine earlier, as Briella had informed Celine earlier in the afternoon, was a sword. It was Ferelden in make, largely functional but with a few hints of ornamentation around the hilt and cross guard to suggest that it was fighting blade of a noble. It was worse for wear with Nyx, along the blade and a few spots of rust. Grand Duke of Spot! Michael moved to put himself between Selene and the sword. The weapon would have never made it into the hall. Guards at the palace entrance checked all packages to prevent an assassin from bringing a weapon inside, which was, Selene reflected, why Gaspard had gone to so much trouble to get the package smuggled in and hidden in the hedge mage earlier that day. At ease, Chevalier, Gaspard eyed the blade. I'd as soon come at someone with a fireplace poker as I would w wield that thing. He nodded at Van Tegan. It was taken off the body of some Ferelden noblewoman who got caught making trouble for poor Megrin. Moira, I believe. Behind his gold and green mask, his eyes twinkled with good humor. Our servants have been using it to kill rats in the cellars. Tegan had gone still, looking at the sword in his hands as though the rest of the court had vanished. The green velvet bunched around his white knuckled fists. That's a noble sword, Melkinder asked, adding just the right touch of doubt to lure the crowd into laughing at the battered blade and drive Tegan further towards saying something that Gaspard would construe as an insult. It was a simple play, but an effective one. Van Tegan would be goaded until he said something in anger. Then Melkinder would, be ga would gasp in shock to ensure that even the dimmest nobles would understand that they should take offense. Selene would then try to get to choose between having Sir Michael challenge Van Tegan to satisfy Relay's honor and saying nothing, allow Gaspar to brandish his Chevalier's code of honor and deliver the challenge himself. Either result would sour or relations between Orle and Frelden, moving them closer to another foolish war. War was where Gaspard shone brightest. All this crossed Selene's mind, even as Gaspard twisted the knife. Well, she called herself the Rebel Queen. Closer to being a bandit or a mercenary captain, really. She thought she could drive us out of Frelden. And she was right, Tegan said, still not looking at Gaspard. Her son Merrick drove you all out of our kingdom. Shay Mora didn't live to see it, Gaspard said, looking around the room with a grin. Perhaps if she had one of your big dogs. A few nobles laughed. It was just enough to drive Tegan over the edge. Celine saw his shoulders tense, saw him open his mouth to say exactly what Gaspard had been waiting for. Ban Tegan, she called out. She had ruled the greatest empire in the world for 20 years, and she knew how to send her voice slicing through a crowd to drive it to silence. Mouth still half open, the Ferelden noble turned to her. Because she and Gaspard had played the game for long enough to be old familiar friends, enemies. She gave her cousin a tiny smile before stepping forward. Excellent try. The smile said, and next time perhaps you should be clever enough to succeed, but not tonight. Your Imperial Majesty, Van Tegan stood ready, the veins in his neck taut. I see from your expression that this blade has awakened old feelings in you. Has Orlais given you offense in the death of Moira Theron, Rebel Queen of Ferelden? As the crowd took a collected breath, she added, do you, do you demand satisfaction? Tegan looked down at the blade in his hands and then over at Gaspard. And finally, because he might have been lackluster at the game, but he was not a fool, he looked at Selene her herself, judged her stance, and quietly said, I do. 
As the crowd erupted into yells, Celine smiled. Gaspard closed his eyes and shook his head, already knowing that he had lost, while his bod Melkendag looked to him in confusion, clearly uncertain how she was supposed to pull the crowd now. Celine looked over at Michael and gave a tiny nod, and her champion drew his blade. The yelling of the crowd of nobles went silent at the sight of bared silverite shining blue in the grand ballroom. Then satisfaction you will have, Celine said to the Ferelden ambassador. Sir Michael? Your radiance, Michael said, blade drawn, never taking his eyes off Bantigan. We have been challenged, and you are my champion. Do you stand ready to defend the honor of Rolay in a duel between men of noble birth? Without pause, Sir Michael said, I do not, your radiance. Since we are the challenge party, it, it falls to us to choose the weapons used in the duel. We may, we may not proceed until we do so. Aha. Uh -huh. Celine paused for a moment, letting it build. I see. I would be loath to stain the still-mending friendship between our two nations with noble blood shed in the defense of past slights. She turned to Bantigan. Thus, as is my right, for the weapons in this duel, I choose feathers. Very good, your radiance, Sir Michael said, and without hesitation he plucked the tall yellow feather from his mask. The nobles in the crowd were fickle, blood bloodthirsty, and vain, but above all, they were hers. As much as they would have enjoyed the scandal of a bloody duel, they admired a good display of wit. As Sir Michael brought his feather up with the crisp precision of a master swordsman, the nobles burst into, into delighted laughter. Ben Tegan visibly relaxed, dropping the velvet-wrapped bundle to his side and giving Celine a relieved smile. Your radiance, I regret that I am unarmed for a duel of this nature. You may note that my nation prefers fur to feathers. When he raised his fur-trimmed sleeves, he even got a laugh from the crowd. Quite so. Celine looked over at Gaspard, who had assumed the polite smile one used in court, to deny one's enemies the satisfaction of a snarl. Cousin, you have shown your generosity to our cousins in Ferelden's with your first gift tonight. She raised a hand and gestured in gratitude. Would you be so kind as to offer a second? Gaspard blinked, then bowed. Nothing could please me more. He said, and with a quick and controlled gesture, he plucked his own feather from his mask. Then he handed the yellow feather, the honored symbol of the legendary Orlesian Chevaliers, to the Ferelden doglord he had just insulted. As Sir Michael and Ben Tegan thrust and parried with their feathers to the delighted laughter of the crowd, Celine smiled and called for Mekinder to sing something celebratory. Brielle came to Empress Celine's bedchamber that night through a secret door hidden behind a full-length mirror on one wall. The Empress had bathed after the ball, she often did, and changed into a satin nightgown of rich velvet, violet. The candle at her writing desk was barely enough to illuminate the pages she had been reading, and most of the room was lit only by the light coming in from the window, the pale yellow of the autumn moon above and the warmer orange of Val Royo itself below. Has he spoken yet? Celine asked, not turning around from where she had sat at her writing desk. Brielle smiled at the Empress, whose long blonde hair was still touched with damp, catching the moonlight as it streamed down her back. Yes, though I did not think it was worth interrupting your evening. Your former captain of the guards has already confessed to smuggling in Gaspard's gift, and has thrown himself upon your mercy. What an optimistic decision on his part. Celine chuckled, put down her pen, and turned to Briella. Celine's face was, as it had been since childhood, a finer version of her mask. Fine bones, porcelain skin and red lips, 
that naturally curved sweetly. And the Chatelaine? Briala hesitated, and Celine offered her a curious smile. Finally, Briala said, Foolish and infatuated, but not disloyal. Thinking of Disrael and Ryaline, who might have been whipped had the duck not been satisfactory, she added, Though some gentle chastisement might ensure that she accepts her newfound disappointment with grace and dignity. Celine stood, still smiling. Of course, she said as she came forward. Given our victory tonight over Grand Duke Gaspard, generosity is only appropriate. Celine's fingers traced softly on the side of Briella's neck, and with a tiny rasp, Briella's mask slid free. After all, Bria, she said softly as she set the mask aside, one must make allowances for mistakes brought on by infatuation. Briella smelled roses and honeysuckle as her naked cheek grazed Celine's, the gentle scent of an empress's bath and the satin of the nightgown was cool between Briella's fingers, as it slid away to bare, pale skin. Whatever you feel best, your radiance, she whispered, and with her free hand, snuffed out the candle. And that was chapter one. <laughs> <laughs>